So we'll begin shortly. Um, there are still a, a few people who are signing on. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. I know that there are still a few of you signing on, but we're very happy to see the high amount of interest and happy to have you all um, joining us for our first um, presentation, uh, webinar of this uh, series, Minority Health and Health Disparities um, in Neuroscience. Uh, this webinar series offers the opportunity to share research advances, lessons learned, regarding cross-cutting challenges and opportunities in the field. And so it gives me great pleasure to introduce Dr. Elizabeth Rose Maida, uh, who will give us a presentation entitled Towards Health Equity and Brain Aging, Non-Traditional Data Sources and, Innovation to, and Innovative Tools. Uh, before our speaker gets started, um, I'll just like to let you know that at the end of the presentation, we will allow times for our questions. And if you do have a question, please type it in the question box, the Q&A box, and we will ask it on your behalf. So just to briefly introduce our speaker, Dr. Maida is an associate professor in the Department of Epidemiology at UCLA Fielding School of Public Health. Her research focuses on identifying modifiable determinants of cognitive decline and dementia and stroke in late life. Her research program has both applied and methodological themes. She focuses on describing and identifying mechanisms contributing to disparities in late life uh, cognitive and brain health, and also leads work addressing methodological challenges in longitudinal studies of stroke, cognitive aging, and dementia risk. Her long-time research goals are to identify effective population level strategies to prevent dementia and to eliminate disparities in dementia, and to develop tools to strengthen causal inference in dementia research in lifelong epidemiology. And so I'll pass the Zoom on to Dr. Meida. Thank you. I should share my screen. Okay, do you see, see my screen? I hope so. So yes, absolutely. Okay, great. Thank you, uh, Dr. Martin, for the introduction and for the invitation to um, be here today. I'm really excited to uh, share my research. So I want to start by just taking a step back and thinking about the goals of health equity research. And so I think ultimately, the goal of health equity research is to identify the drivers of racial, ethnic, and other social inequalities in health to ultimately inform policies and programs to promote health equity. And I think it can be easy to forget in our day-to-day um, -day research that this is our ultimate goal, but I think it's really helpful to, to try to hold on to this when we think about our research. But within this, in terms of thinking about building an evidence base to promote health equity, goals of individual research projects, can include research that describes the extent to which health inequalities exist, and then evaluate whether the inequalities are larger or smaller in different settings or over time. So for example, are uh, inequalities in healthy aging greater or smaller in states with um, more investments in public education? And how, does, how do these inequalities change over time? Are we making progress towards promoting health equity? And then we also have arms of research that really focus on evaluating the extent to which particular factors contribute to health inequalities. So uh, does the prevalence of this uh, risk or resilience factor differ across social groups? And also does the effect or, of this um, risk or resilience factor vary by social group? And in, in EPI, we would call this effect matter modification. So looking at the, the prevalence of 
risk and resilience factors across groups and different potential differences in the effects of these risk and resilience factors on um, health and wellness in aging. So there are a few broad methodological themes I'm going to talk about today, in particular with a focus in dementia disparities research. The first is the diversity of study samples and who ends up in our studies. So obviously we, we can't um, evaluate health disparities or health in minoritized populations if they're not included in our research studies. And I wanna draw this distinction between representation and representativeness, where actually groups that make up smaller proportions of the current US older adult population, we actually need to oversample them. Just having a representative sample isn't necessarily enough to have them represented in our research. So for example, Asian Americans make up about 5% of the older adult population in the United States. And if we have a nationally representative study, we're just not going to have enough data on Asian Americans to really draw inferences about health in Asian Americans. And then a second point I wanna make is selection into our study sample. So we're almost never just interested in drawing inferences about the people in our study. We're always interested in drawing inferences about broader populations. So we study samples to try to understand drivers of health and health disparities in broader populations. So encouraging us to think, I think it's relevant to think about what are the target populations we want to draw inferences about and keep that in mind when we think about designing our sampling frames in our studies and then evaluating how the people in our studies differ from the populations we are aiming to draw inferences about. Another methodological consideration are measurement of our outcomes, including cognitive function, rate of cognitive change, and cognitive impairment and dementia, especially in uh, educationally, ethnically, and linguistically diverse populations. This is really important for understanding health disparities in dementia because delays in diagnosis in one group relative to another could lead to spurious differences in dementia incidence rates. So we really want to make sure that we're drawing inferences about true differences or true disparities in dementia versus differences in, that are just spurious due to differences in timing of diagnosis, for example. And I think it's also really key when we're thinking about health equity research to think about measurement of social experiences. So theoretically motivated, carefully measured social experiences that we care about that are relevant to understanding health, how to promote health equity. And the, the theme here I'm talking about are, are methods, but one of the key things I also want to highlight are that methods are a tool for answering questions. And so it's really important that we strive to answer clear, theoretically motivated questions and then identify the methods that we need to use to try to answer those, those questions. But the methods are useless if we don't start with clear, theoretically motivated questions. So in terms of research on racial ethnic disparities in dementia, um, in 2011, the National Alzheimer's Plan identified reducing racial and ethnic disparities in dementia as a national priority. But at the time, there were really very few studies of dementia incidents and samples that represent the racial ethnic diversity of the United States population. So the evidence base that motivated this uh, national priority was really based on piecing together evidence from studies that each had one or two racial ethnic groups. Um, and I think that's relevant for determining the priority, but it makes it really difficult to try to identify whether we're making progress towards promoting equity in, in brain aging and uh, dementia. Because um, comparing rates across studies is difficult since dementia rates are extremely sensitive to the diagnostic criteria that are applied in a given study. So that makes it difficult to compare across studies. And another complication are that when we're comparing across studies, geographic patterns or heterogeneity within racial ethnic groups may contribute to differences between studies as well. So this um, was the motivation for uh, th this work we published in 2016, where we used data from Kaiser Permanente Northern California to try to quantify the extent to which there were racial ethnic inequalities in dementia incidents in a California population. So a healthcare system cohort might not seem like the natural data source to use for health equity research, but there are a few things that I think make Kaiser Permanente Northern California a really compelling data set for this type of research. First, I want to highlight that Kaiser is an integrated healthcare delivery system. So that means that these aren't billing codes, these are diagnosis codes. 
and most people are getting all of their care within this system. I also want to highlight that the Kaiser membership is large and that the membership it overall does a pretty good job of representing the uh, diversity of the region, with the exception that people at the extreme tails, the income distribution are underrepresented. And Kaiser members are often state members for a long time. I can say that's definitely true with my family. Um, and they've had, um, we're really on the forefront of launching electronic medical records. They're coming up on, on like 25 years of electronic medical records on this kind of stable population that's, that's racially and ethnically diverse. And so um, th these were the results from a study of about 300,000 older adult Kaiser members followed for um, 14 years using EHR data where we uh, measured dementia incidence rates by race ethnicity. Uh, we saw that dementia incidence rates were highest in African Americans, followed by American Indians and Alaska Natives, um, and were very similar in this sample in Latinos, Pacific Islanders, and non-Latino whites, and lowest in Asian Americans. The bars here represent confidence intervals, and you'll notice that the estimates were the, the least precise in Pacific Islanders because there are only about 400 people in that sample, but we thought it was important to include them given that there's really a paucity of evidence on aging and dementia in, in this population. The, the next thing I want to highlight is that we went from not only looking at dementia incidence rates, but we also looked at cumulative 25-year dementia risk, taking into account both dementia rates and also mortality rates. And so these 25-year uh, communal risks, conditional on survival, dementia-free to age 65, can kind of be seen as lifetime risk of a dementia diagnosis for somebody who sur survives to age 65. And we do see heterogeneity by race and ethnicity here, but what I really want to highlight is that we see that dementia, lifetime dementia risk is high in, in all racial ethnic groups, even, even groups that have re relatively lower uh, dementia incidence rates, which just really highlights the importance of studying determinants of dementia and potential strategies to prevent dementia in, in all racial ethnic groups. But one of the things we were really acutely aware of in the study is that we were relying on the EHR, so we were relying on dementia diagnosis in the medical record, which was the motivation for this next study where we looked at survival after dementia diagnosis. Um, so the, the motivation here was that we really tried to think about, okay, we have this EHR data, we're relying on dementia diagnosis, what can we really try to do to try to evaluate whether the timing of diagnosis could um, could lead to, could be a contributing factor to the differences we're observing in dementia incidence rates by race ethnicity. So we tried to think really hard, what can we do with the data we have, EHR data? And um, we identified this plan to look at survival after dementia diagnosis. So the idea here is that because there are currently no disease modi modifying treatments for dementia, that, that dementia will impact mortality similarly by race ethnicity. And if this were true um, and timing of diagnosis were the only thing that were contributing to the difference, racial ethnic differences in dementia incidence rates, under this framework, we would see African-Americans just simply being diagnosed earlier in the disease process and Asian Americans being diagnosed later in the disease process. And if that, that were true, then we would assume we would see longer survival after dementia diagnosis in African-Americans and shorter um, survival after dementia diagnosis in, in Asian Americans. So that was this motivation for this study to look at survival after dementia diagnosis, which is of course of great relevance to uh, people diagnosed with dementia, their loved ones and, and their providers as well. So here were our, our first findings from this study. These are looking at um, survival after dementia diagnosis for people in, this, in the Kaiser population with an incident dementia diagnosis. And I'm showing the, the medium, median and uh, in, um, first and third quartile of survival time. And what we see here is that survival time was actually not shortest, but longest in Asian Americans with an average uh, median survival time of about four and a half years and shortest in non-Latino whites with a median survival time of about three years. So that does, does not support the hypothesis that Asian Americans are simply just being diagnosed later um, and that that's why we're seeing lower dementia incidence rates. Um, but we thought, how do we try to understand what might be driving these racial ethnic differences in survival after dementia diagnosis? 
And so our approach to this was we thought, well, so far we've just looked at survival after dementia diagnosis. We should probably compare the racial ethnic mortality patterns among people with dementia to people without dementia in this population to try to understand what's going on. And when we looked at this, we found that the racial ethnic mortality patterns among people with dementia, so people who survived to, I think, dementia diagnosis, the average diagnosis age was early 80s, tended to parallel patterns among people of similar ages without dementia. And so this implies that the same factors that drive racial ethnic mortality differences in people with dementia uh, with, um, are so the same factors driving racial ethnic mortality patterns in people without dementia probably account for the mortality differences in, in people with dementia. And I think it provides some evidence that the timing of diagnosis is not a major driver of the racial ethnic inequalities in dementia incidence that we estimated in the previous paper I just showed you. But seeing that, that um, most people are living for several years after dementia diagnosis was a motivation for this next paper um, led by Dr. Eleanor Hayes Larson, a postdoctoral fellow at UCLA, um, where we aimed to look at racial ethnic differences in health related quality of life among persons with and without dementia using data from the National Health and Aging Trend Study or NHATS, which is an NIA funded study. And the motivation for this is that we think that health related maximizing quality of life is really a high priority for, for people living with dementia and the people who love them. And so for this study, we looked at um, racial disparities in health related quality of life. Um, across the cognitive decline uh, continuum and uh, on both the ratio and different scales. So on the left here, I'm showing uh, prevalence ratios for uh, disparities in health-related quality of life. And on the right, I'm showing prevalence differences for, for inequality, racial inequalities in health-related quality of life. And the colors represent, um, the darkest color represents probable dementia, blue possible, and light, lightest blue, no, no dementia. And so what we see overall here is we see evidence of, of racial disparities in health-related quality of life. Um, but we get a little bit of a different story if we were to just look at the ratio scale where we'd see that the disparities actually appear to be largest in the people without dementia, although that's not shown here when we look on the absolute scale or prevalence difference scale. And then we look into the prevalences themselves, we see that this is really driven by just it, very, very high uh, prevalence of poor health-related quality of life among people without dementia, which means the denominator for the ratios um, in these groups is much bigger than in the no dementia group, which really uh, drives this difference in estimated inequalities on the um, ratio scale that's not observed on the um, different scale. And so I think this highlights that when we're trying to understand disparities, we can really get a different answer if we only look on one scale or another. So I'd like to promote thinking about looking at both relative or ratio scales and, and absolute or different scales when trying to quantify disparities and quantify um, unmet needs in, across different populations. So I'm going to switch gears a little bit now and talk about determinants of dementia in Asian Americans, and in particular, exploring heterogeneity between Asian ethnic groups. Um, so this is the same um, EHR-based cohort that we created and pre I presented on initially, um, but instead of just looking at all Asian Americans together, we disaggregated, uh, disaggregated Asian Americans, which as many people know, Asian Americans are not a monolith. We're a heterogeneous population. And so here, um, we when we disaggregated um, Asian Americans, um, in the EHR, we saw evidence of heterogeneity in dementia incidence by Asian ethnicity, although we did see lower estimated dementia incidence rates in each Asian ethnic group examined compared to non-Latino whites. And this was um, the motivation for a follow-up study, which we're now doing, where we're looking at Asian uh, dementia incidence in Asian American ethnic groups in a sub-cohort of Kaiser Permanente Northern California members. So this cohort includes about 18,000 Asian Americans and 150,000 white Kaiser members who participated in one of two harmonized surveys in the early 2000s. And then, um, so we have EHR data coupled with some survey data. And we're using this to, to look at both social and cardiometabolic uh, determinants of dementia by Asian ethnicity. 
So one of the first questions I had when I saw that we saw lower dementia incidence rates in Asian Americans in Kaiser is whether um, whether we might potentially be picking up on some health, healthy immigrant selection and maybe lower dementia incidence rates in Asian Americans was due to, in particular, lower incidence rates in foreign-born Asian Americans due to potential healthy immigrant selection. And um, so this work led by, uh, again, Eleanor Hayes Larson and also in close collaboration with Joey Fong from UCLA, um, we examined dementia incidence rates by nativity. The light blue represents foreign-born participants, and the gray represents U.S.-born participants. And um, what we see is that we do not see evidence of lower dementia incidence in foreign-born participants. If anything, we see evidence of higher dementia incidence rates in Asian Americans, which was we were quite surprised by, and is something that I think is a is definitely a a need for future inquiry to try to investigate why we might be seeing this, but does not, but certainly does not suggest that healthy immigrant selection is contributing to lower dementia incidence rates in Asian Americans and Kaiser. As I mentioned, we're also, in addition to social uh, variables, we're also looking at cardiometabolic factors. And we started with diabetes, given that a lot of data suggests that diabetes is consistently associated with higher dementia risk. And primarily this work is done in white and to a smaller extent, uh, black and uh, Latino populations in the U United States. Um, but we thought it was really relevant to look at in Asian Americans, given that there's a lot of heterogeneity and diabetes prevalence across Asian American groups with some Asian American groups experiencing very, very high prevalence of diabetes. And so the dark bars here represent dementia incidence rates among people with diabetes, and the light bars represent dementia incidence rates among people without diabetes. And we see across all groups, we see higher dementia incidence rates among people with diabetes. But what really stands out is this very high difference in this very large difference in dementia incidence among people with diabetes versus without in the South Asian population in particular. Um, and so to try to quantify that, the, the hazard ratio for non-Latino whites was about a hazard ratio of 1.5, which is fairly consistent with the literature and other studies. But for South Asians, the estimated hazard ratio for diabetes and dementia was 2.4, so much larger magnitude. And so we can see here that both the high prevalence, so South Asians that, that have a very high prevalence of diabetes, so this high prevalence of, of diabetes and large estimated effect of diabetes and dementia suggests that a larger proportion of dementia cases in South Asians may be attributable to diabetes. So this fits in with one of the themes of health equity research that I talked about initially, where when we're trying to understand uh, determinants of dementia across different groups, we consider both the prevalence of, of risk and resilience factors across different groups and also potential differences in the magnitude of the effect of those risk and resilience factors. And so for diabetes, we see both higher prevalence and higher uh, mag estimated magnitude of the effect of diabetes on dementia in South Asians. And given that there's very, very, um, I think next to no research that I'm aware of on dementia in South Asians in the United States, I think this is a, a really important um, area to, to follow up on. And so uh, next I'm gonna switch gears again a little bit and talk about measurement of dementia and disparities research. So thinking about this theme of how are we measuring our outcomes? And in particular, how are we measuring uh, dementia in research studies, especially with an eye on dementia disparities research. And um, a lot of the research I presented so far uses dementia diagnosis from a medical record, um, but in NHATS and that I presented and in um, many other data, large nationally represented population-based samples, um, we use algorithmic dementia classification but it's really relevant to think about how are we building those algorithms and are we measuring the same thing in different populations? Um, so Crystal Shaw, a biostat uh, doctoral candidate at UCLA has an F31 dissert funded dissertation, dissertation um, where she is developing an algorithmic dementia classification framework for, for large studies. So as I mentioned, many large studies have algorithmic dementia classifications, including HRS and NHATS, but existing dementia classification algorithms can only incorporate the information that's available in those large studies. And we know in these large studies, we're trying to look at many dimensions of health and wellness and old age, not just, um, not just cognitive aging. And so we might not be able to devote an hour plus for detailed neuropsychological testing. 
So that means that the dementia probability scores for these algorithms rely on looking at sociodemographic, health and health behavior factors, and some brief cognitive assessments that are missing really rich neuropsychological assessments. So what Crystal has proposed is to use a Bayesian latent class mixture modeling framework to try to um, overcome this challenge. And so as with prior dementia classification algorithms in the health and retirement study, she's used a subset of uh, or a sub study called the Adams study that took place in the early 2000s in HRS. This was a sub study of about 850 HRS participants who underwent several hours of detailed neuropsychological and clinical assessments and dementia adjudication. And Crystal has used th these, um, this Adams data as a prior distributions to feed into a Bayesian latent class mixture model to create a synthetic HCAP cohort. So HCAP is another sub-study of the health and retirement study. This is harmonized cognitive assessment protocol. And this is about 3,500 participants in HRS in 2016 who underwent the detailed neuropsychological assessments. And Crystal has used these Bayesian latent class mixture models to create a synthetic HCAP sample with that includes a predicted dementia diagnosis. So it's like a mass imputation. And then she's further then uses weighting and standardization methods to go from the synthetic HCAP pop sample to represent a synthetic full HRS sample that includes both synthetic uh, neuropsychological assessments in this synthetic sample and predicted dementia diagnosis. So it's a, a different approach for algorithmic dementia classification. So you might say, hey, Elizabeth Rosencrystal, this sounds really great. How do we know that it's really working? How can you test? Um, and so for this, uh, Crystal has used uh, simulations to evaluate whether this algorithmic dementia classification uh, really system can really um, return reasonable estimates of dementia prevalence in the United States. And in particular, we're looking at race specific dementia prevalence estimates for inequalities research. So for this simulation, and I'll say, so simulations can be really useful for um, trying to evaluate performance of statistical tools. And that's the way that Crystal is using simulations here. So her basic steps in the simulation is that she created a super population of 1 million people, and she did this by drawing real data from HRS with replacement to preserve the um, covariate, the joint covariate distributions in the real data. And then in this super population of 1 million people she created, we define that as the, the truth. So the true race-specific dementia prevalence in the super population. And then in simulations, what we often do is we draw, draw from this superpopulation. So she took a thousand iterations of sampling and HRS sample from the superpopulation and then applied the Bayesian latent class mixture model to each of these HRS samples and estimated race specific dementia prevalence. And here are her uh, preliminary results. We're showing dementia prevalence here by, by race and ethnicity across varying uh, sample size sizes. And the red bar represents the dementia prevalence in the superpopulation. So that's the truth we're trying to recover from these samples in HRS and in our synthetic HRS. And so um, what we see here is overall, we do a pr pretty good job in particular when the sample sizes get larger and also in particular for, for non-Latino whites. And that's because the these Bayesian latent class mixture models as with prior algorithms um, in, for dementia and HRS rely on Adams data. Um, and there were a greater number of white participants in Adams. And so this also highlights the need for representation in research that our algorithms are trained based on the, these higher quality sub-studies. And we need representation for the algorithms to really um, perform similarly across different sociodemographic groups. And so moving from um, algorithmic dementia classification to thinking about a more traditional cohort study and how we're measuring dementia, I want to highlight some work we've done in the CANDLE study or Kaiser Healthy Aging and Diverse Life Experiences study. And so this is a cohort study of about 1,700 uh, long-term Kaiser Permanente members who identify as Asian, uh, Black or African American, Latino or non-Latino white. And so we've constructed basically a life course uh, cohort uh, where we have data dating about from the 1960s um, to 1996 that we can leverage, and then uh, traditional cohort study we can data we can link that from starting in uh, 2017. 
And so unlike the prior Kaiser studies where we were relying on EHR, here this is a traditional cohort study in terms of a, a dementia measurement. And Dr. Dan Mungus from UC Davis really was, I think, what created a really innovative design for our dementia adjudication protocol. Um, so we have about 1,700 participants, as I said, and all participants undergo a detailed uh, for about 45-minute neuropsych test battery, the CNIS or Spanish English neuropsych Neuropsychological Assessment Scales, and also complete a few um, cognitive measures as part of the NIH toolbox, which is done on an iPad. And so about a third of the sample were randomly selected to go through the full, be invited to participate in this full dementia adjudication protocol. But the other two thirds of participants, we called our screen selection group, and we developed an algorithm based on the NIH toolbox scores, um, which can be generated um, immediately because it's done on the iPad to classify people as low probability for cognitive impairment, in which case they didn't undergo further evaluation or high probability. And in that case, they underwent clinical neuropsych testing. And based on clinical neuropsych testing scores, they were either deemed um, cognitively normal and didn't undergo further evaluation, or if they had abnormal neuropsych, underwent clinical exam and adjudication. And so I think this is a really nifty protocol that, that Dan developed that's efficient. Not all participants underwent the full dementia adjudication process, um, but, but many did. And I think it's um, efficient and I think another cool thing that Dan built into the protocol is we also had this potential to look at diagnostic bias. The diagnosticians uh, who do the di uh, adjudication tried making um, dementia diagnoses with different levels of information available to them. So considering whether they were, they were able to see participant demographic characteristics and whether neuropsychological test scores they saw were demographically adjusted or not. So things that I think could be potential controversies about what's the best way to diagnose dementia. And in Candle, um, we didn't see strong evidence that those different levels of evidence made a big difference in terms of uh, estimates of prevalence of cognitive impairment in the cohort, uh, which suggests um, limited amount of diagnostic bias in this sample. But you can imagine this also might differ depending on expertise of the clinicians, and I think it um, is something to consider um, replicating with, with broader sets of clinicians as well. Um, and I think one of the things I want to highlight with diagnostic bias and linking this back to algorithmic dementia classification is that the algorithmic dementia classifications are trained on diagnosis decisions that are made by real diagnosticians. And so any any bias that's built in to the decisions that are made by real life diagnosticians are going to be carried through to algorithms that are trained based on those uh, diagnostic decisions. And so switch moving from thinking about measurement of dementia to measurement of life course experiences that are relevant to um, healthy aging and dementia. I want to talk a little bit about, about sequence analysis as one potential approach for characterizing life course experiences. And in this specific paper, we um, wanted to evaluate whether work family profiles between early and midlife influence memory trajectories in later life for women in the United States. And so for this question, we use data from the health and retirement study on women who were born in the 1930s through 50s. And these HRS participants retrospectively reported uh, for every year between ages of 16 and 50, whether they were participating in the paid labor force, which I'll say, I'll say working for shorthand, um, whether they were married and whether they had uh, children under age 18 at home. And so from all of this information, we created work family trajectories for each woman. And so here, I'm Ill, uh, this illustration shows work family trajectories for two hypothetical women. Um, and we see that this woman on the left um, entered the paid labor force uh, after, when she entered adulthood and continued uh, consistently participating in the paid labor force without children. And this woman on the right is somebody who first entered the paid labor force in early adulthood, um, then spent her, uh, her late 20s, 30s, and 40s uh, working with children uh, with a partner um, before um, and then continued in the workforce after her children left the home in her late 40s. So that's just two women, but in real data, there's an index plot showing like the dizzying array of possible of all the sequences for the, the all of the women in the sample. You see there's like a lot of heterogeneity here. And so part of sequence analysis is first creating these trajectories and then using a clustering analysis strategy to try to group 
women who have similar trajectories. Um, and so that's what we did. And we looked at these sequences, these sequence, um, these, these patterns, and um, looked at how the women with these different work family patterns, how that um, influenced rate of memory decline. And so um, what really stands out when we're looking at these memory trajectories is we see slower rates of memory decline for the women who engaged in the paid labor force shown by the solid lines compared to women who were not in consistently engaged in the paid labor force, which is shown by the dashed lines. So to just walk through it, we saw that at age 60, after controlling four variables, we considered potential confounders, including childhood SES, region of birth, educational attainment, for example, birth, birth year, um, we didn't see major differences in memory scores at age 60. But then after age 60, we saw differences in memory trajectories, um, such that if we look at this gold line here, so the working non-mothers, this gold line at the top, their memory scores at age 70, the uh, non-working women had already declined to this level of memory score by age 65, which suggests, suggests between ages 60 and 70, the women um, who were not engaged in the paid labor force, paid labor force earlier in the life course declined twi about twice as fast as the women who were engaged in the paid labor force. Um, we also disaggregated this largest group, the working married mothers, and saw that the um, memory trajectories were really similar for this group, including women who worked continuously throughout motherhood and uh, women who took shorter or longer periods out of the workforce while they raised their children. Um, and so I think that this highlights the, the potential power of sequence analysis to characterize life course exposures. And I think also leads some, to many open questions about what is it about paid labor force participation that might help um, promote cognitive health and later life for, for women in the United States. So the, the last theme I'd like to talk about today is thinking about selection into aging research, both selection into our study samples and selective survival to old age. So one of the things I wanna remind you of is that we're never interested, I think, or I would argue we're never interested just in the people in our study. We always are interested in what can these people in our study tell us about the broader populations that we want to be able to understand um, the determinants and disparities of aging and wellness so that we can ultimately inform development of policies and programs to, to help more people uh, leave, live longer, healthier lives. And so as an example of how sample selection biases can help, can actually lead to us getting the wrong answers um, in our study samples, I have this, this simple example. Um, let's say we're trying to evaluate educational inequalities in Alzheimer's disease from a convenient sample because we're trying to get really high quality biomarkers. Let's like do some um, amyloid and tau imaging, as well as MRI, and possibly brain donation. So we know that these samples are often highly selected because we're asking a lot of participants who are participating in these studies. So let's say in the general, we have this uh, the general population here, and I have just um, people with high education here represented by the graduation caps, and I also have genetic risk represented by the APOE E4 allele and blue color here. So let's say high educational attainment and family history of dementia are two factors that drive study participation, especially in these studies where we're asking a lot of participants a lot of their time and potential invasive procedures. And if these two factors drive study participation, we can actually induce a spurious correlation between these factors in the study sample. So you'll see in the general population here, one in four people are E4 carriers in both the high and low education groups. But because high education and family history of dementia drive study participation, we see this correlation between genetic risk and education induced in our study samples, such that still one in four people in, with high education are E4 carriers, but three out of four people with low education are E4 carriers. And so what would this, what conclusions would we draw from this study about educational disparities in, in Alzheimer's disease? We would probably be overestimating educational disparities in Alzheimer's disease. And this is one simple toy example that just has two factors in it. But in reality, when we're trying to understand determinants of dementia and social inequalities in dementia, there are numerous factors that we know influence study participation in really unpredictable ways. And so I think it's really high priority that we characterize drivers of study participation 
and measure them so that um, we can attempt to understand how our study samples differ from general populations we want to draw inferences about. And then we have a chance to use tools to try to extend the findings from study participation to the general population. But we can't use any methods to, to fix potential selection bias if we, if we don't have um, these selection factors measured. So um, some of the work we've done to try to work on extending findings from study samples to broader populations has again been led by Dr. Eleanor Hayes Larson uh, with support from uh, Taylor Mobley at UCLA. Um, and so here we're again using data from Candle, that uh, cohort study nested within Kaiser that I mentioned earlier. Um, and Kaiser is more diverse than many studies, but we know that selection issues still persist. So to be in Candle, because we were creating this life course study, Everyone needed to be a California, you know, living in Northern California and have access to healthcare for since the 1960s or 70s. So that's one thing there where we know it's, it's selected on those things by design. Um, but we want to, but we don't want, as I mentioned, to just draw inferences about the people in Candle. We want to draw inferences to broader populations. And so here we've defined our target population that we want to draw inferences about as the California population of older adults that were represented by the California Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance uh, System survey. And so this is, um, or, or BRFIS, this is a CDC um, run uh, population representative telephone survey. Um, and so we can use data from BRFIS coupled with CANDLE to try to understand the sample selection process into CANDLE. So how do people in CANDLE differ from the target population and then use weighting methods to model that selection process. And then you apply weighting methods to try to extend or generalize or transport or some of the words we can use to extend the findings from candle back to the target population. So in this table here, I'm just highlighting a few characteristics of candle versus the California purpose. You see the candle participants are a little bit older than this. And I think both of these are 60 plus. Um, we have more racial and ethnic diversity in Candle than the California purpose, and this highlights what I mentioned earlier about in order to have representative representation, we can't just have representative study. Um, we see that people in Candle have higher levels of education and, and higher self-rated health, as with, as with many of our um, cohort studies that we use in the field. And so um, Eleanor and Taylor compared the characteristics, so not just the ones I showed there, but various different health and health behavior and sociodemographic factors across Candle and, Ber and the California population represented by Burfus, and then um, modeled the selection process and then applied weights to try to make Candle look more like the California population represented by Burfus. And here I'm showing estimates of racial, ethnic inequalities and cognitive impairment prevalence on both the ratio scale, prevalence ratio and prevalence difference scale. And the gray represents the unweighted candle results and the blue represents the candle results after we've used uh, weighting to generalize to the California population. Um, and we see there's a little bit of variability across groups, but overall the results were fairly similar um, before and after we applied the weighting method. And on, on one hand, this is cautiously good, a good sign that the findings from candle generalize to broader populations we care about. But one caveat of this is that in Candle, as with all studies, we only could compare characteristics and apply these and model these characteristics of things that were measured in both studies. So again, I think a really high priority for aging research is to really understand factors that drive study participation and incorporate these measures into our highly characterized cohort studies of aging, as well as population-based uh, or population representative surveys. So we can try to understand how our study samples differ from the target populations we care about, and then apply statistical tools to try to extend findings from our samples to, to broader populations. And this can apply here. This is done in Candle with cognitive impairment, but we're not limited to measures like cognitive impairment and dementia. Um, we can also look at AD biomarkers as well. Uh, so I want to just close um, by also thinking about, so far I've talked about selection into study samples, um, but there I also want to talk about this potential for selective survival. So who gets to survive to old age in the United States? Um, and how does that influence the inferences that we draw about um, social, racial, ethnic, and other social uh, disparities in, in aging? Um, and so 
Um, for example, uh, numerous studies have documented a qualitative change in black-white inequalities in stroke incidence in the United States, just such that stroke incidence rates are higher in black versus white older adults in midlife. And this attenuates with age such that stroke incidence rates are lower in uh, black versus white adults among the oldest old. This has been shown in numerous studies, but I think the, the best evidence comes from the regard study or reasons for ethnic and geographic uh, disparities in, in stroke. And um, so we, we see this trend here. So these, this black line represents the findings from um, regards. And I think on, on one hand, this could be interpret, interpreted as representing an attenuation of racial disparities in stroke across the life course. But I think if we really think about the life force consequences of racism, I, I'm skeptical of, of that as an explanation. And another potential explanation is selective survival. There are extreme racial disparities in life expectancy in the United States. And how does that potentially, that could potentially give rise to black adults who survive to old age are a healthier, more selected population than white adults who so survived old age. And that might be what's driving this uh, qualitative change in racial disparities in stroke incidents. But it's really difficult to evaluate that empirically. So we used simulation studies to try to evaluate the plausibility of this hypothesis. So earlier I talked about a simulation study where Crystal, uh, the, uh, Crystal Shaw used simulations to try to evaluate performance of a statistical tool. Another way that we can use simulation studies is to try to test the potential data generating structures that we can hypothesize that we think might give rise to what we see and observe what we observe in empirical data, but can't but can't test with the empirical data we have. Um, so in the simulations, I assumed that there was a true age constant black white stroke incidence rate difference in in my simulated cohort. So I took the incidence rate difference um, observed in the 40 to 50 year. 45 to 55 year age band and assume that was constant across ages. And anytime I simulate, I always like to start with a, a scenario that that would not be the data, a data generating structure that would not be consistent with the um, with a phenomenon that I'm trying to, to test. And so I always like to start with a scenario, in this case, I call it a no bias scenario. So there's preserving the racial disparities in survival distributions, but not incorporating this differential selection into who survives old age by race. But when we generated a scenario where there was selective survival, such that there was a shared moderate risk factor that influenced stroke risk and mortality that had larger effects in Black versus white older adults, you can imagine this could be like a genetic risk factor that has the same distribution in Black versus white older adults, but potentially larger effects due to consequences of racism that we saw this replication of this overall pattern of a qualitative change in racial inequalities in stroke. And so I think this can't prove that this is the explanation, but it, it provides evidence that that's a plausible explanation. And I think it's a reminder that when we're doing aging research and we're just looking at um, health inequalities in old age, we need to think about potential, if we don't think about the life course consequences of racism and discrimination, we could be getting the wrong answers about the extent to which uh, disparities actually exist in late life. So I'm going to close with a few what I see as opportunities and future directions in uh, aging equity research. And I think it's, again, helpful to think about what are our goals here and remember that our long term or broader goal, I think that we're all interested in, is trying to build an evidence base that can help inform policies and programs to promote health equity. So one of the first key areas I want to talk about is, again, the diversity of study samples and sample selection. So we can't measure disparities, we can't measure disparity, and we can't uh, understand whether we're making progress or losing ground in disparities if we don't have um, representation across different social groups in our studies. And in particular, to have representation, we, we often need to oversample groups that are smaller percentages of the US population as well as carefully consider who's the target population we want to draw inferences about, who's in our study sample, and how do the people in our study sample differ? And, and if they do differ, which I think they almost always probably do, um, can we use transportability tools to try to extend findings from the sample to the target populations we care about? <laughs> 
So I think we can think about this when we're designing our studies, making this possible, and then applying the tools in the analytic phases as well to evaluate potential selection bias and try to remediate it with weighting or other methods. I also think there's a lot of exciting new research on measurement of cognitive function, cognitive change, and dementia, and in particular, thinking about advances of, uh, in development of algorithmic dementia classification for large population-based studies that I think do the best job of um, representing um, the target populations we care about, and also consideration and quantification of diagnostic bias, which again is relevant for our traditional studies with um, traditional diagnosis, dementia adjudication protocols, but remembering that those any sort of bias is always baked into algorithms as well. And also highlight the importance of thinking about measurement of exposures that are relevant to health equity. I think in recent years, there's been increasing recognition of structural racism as a public health um, as a major public health challenge. And so I think many people have more recently begun to evaluate structural racism, but I think it's important for any of us who are new to structural racism to represent, to, to recognize and build on the literature by, uh, that's been developed by previous scholars who have expertise in structural racism. And Adkins Jackson et al. and Dean and Thorpe have a couple, uh, both have published, I think really um, nice, commentaries in American Journal of Epidemiology in the past year that talk about what structural racism is, what it isn't, and how we can measure it. And I also want to highlight that it's relevant to also think about resilience factors in minoritized populations and not just focus on risk factors, but um, resilience factors that might be relevant to minoritized populations as well. Also under this uh, theme of, of measurement of exposures relevant to like to health equity, I want to think about tools for characterizing life course exposures. And um, I highlighted one paper where you sequence analysis to characterize work family profiles throughout early and, and midlife. Um, but Bobble et al. Have, have really led, I think, some really interesting work looking at using sequence analysis to understand type and timing and duration of education on health in, in mid uh, to late life. Um, and I've highlighted one of her papers in American Journal of Epidemiology here. And I think another really exciting area of innovation is really thinking about how we can link interview data with administrative records to maybe sort of try to reconstruct life course data sets. Um, uh, in collaboration with Joan Casey at Columbia University, I'm uh, working on using 1940 census data linked with HRS to try to, to look at life course uh, determinants of um, healthy uh, of cognitive decline in dementia and racial disparities in cognitive decline in dementia. And this was made possible by the work led by Rob Warren at the at University of Minnesota to, um, to link the uh, 1940 census data with modern surveys, including the health and retirement sur survey. Um, and, and lastly, I'd really love to see measurement of inequalities on both relative and absolute scales, as you saw with the study I presented led by Eleanor Hayes Larson looking at racial disparities and health-related quality of life, we might get a different answer or we might draw different conclusions if we only look at um, measures on a relative scale or an absolute scale. And so I wanna um, highlight the relevance of considering inequalities on both relative and absolute scales to try to understand uh, the extent to which um, health inequalities exist. Um, I'd like to thank all of my collaborators on the work I've presented today, as well as my funding. And um, thank you uh, for listening. Thank you so much. That was a great presentation. And we've received quite a few questions. And also, um, as someone wanted to know if a recording of this presentation will be available, they thought it was amazing. And so, yes, there will be a recording available. And we will share the link with all of you uh, once we have prepared the recording and, and put it up on our website. So thank you once again, because you've given us so much to think about in terms of how we select our study participants, how we evaluate who's selected, um, and then how we interpret the data uh, that, we're, um, that we're seeing uh, from the study participants that are you know, part of our, our research. So there's a lot to think about there. We have a few questions. Um, the first question is, can you please comment on bias in estimating dementia incidence from diagnostic codes? Yeah, so I think that's definitely something to be concerned about. And as I mentioned, we tried to evaluate it by looking at survival after dementia diagnosis. It's not perfect, but we thought that's something that we could try to do. And so while it doesn't say it's it's perfect, it's not contributing to the estimated disparities, it helps 
provide some evidence that what we're picking up on is real. Um, and I think it's certainly as the candle study matures, I think it's also going to be relevant for us to compare dementia incidence rates that we measure in the study compared to the EHR. But it's certainly something um, to be to be aware of. And I also want to highlight that I think a broader theme in um, aging research is also thinking about triangulation of evidence across study designs that have different strengths and weaknesses. And so while we had a lot of strengths of the EHR-based data in terms of the sample size and the diversity and long follow-up, there's also, I think, you know, the, the dementia diagnosis from the EHR was something we were relying on. And so really having that coupled with evidence from traditional cohort studies that have traditional dementia adjudication, I think can, can really help build a strong evidence base. Great. Um, there's another question uh, for the HRQOL. How do you account for patient recall bias? If patients indeed have dementia, presumably they may have a harder time answering those questions due to the level of cognitive impairment. Was family reporting considered in these studies? Yeah, that's that's definitely a potential challenge. Um, pro proxy reporting was available, although I think you can also imagine that proxy reporting. Um, ideally, you'd like to hear from an individual themselves, but, and so proxy reporting might not be perfect, but I think, you know, an alternative is having no information on health-related quality of life among uh, people with more advanced dementia, and um, so I think this is, again, there's, there, it's not perfect, but I think it's it's relevant to contributing to the evidence base on, on quality of life among people living with dementia. Good question. Sure. Yes. Uh, the next question, um, did the study account for language barrier over estimation of dementia in the immigrant population? Um, oh, so that's probably in in the, the Kaiser study where we looked at um, differences in dementia incidence by nativity. So the, the survey that we have um, was done in, it was available in Spanish, English, and, and Chinese. And so I think one limitation when we think about who's in the study sample is um, people who were either able to complete the survey or have a family member assist them in completing the survey. The instructions did say somebody could help you, but it means that we probably are under capturing people who, who don't speak English or don't have a family member who speaks English where they decided to ask in the survey. So um, Eleanor and uh, Julia are actually leading work right now where we're trying to replicate these analyses where we evaluate the selection into the study sample um, by Asian ethnicity to try to understand how the Asian Americans in this sample compare to the California population of Asian Americans. Because I think that's mm -hmm. yeah, definitely something, something to uh, consider. Okay, that's great. And then there was another question related to the um, South Asian uh, populations that you show. Could you comment a little bit about who was included in that population group? Yeah, I think um, so. There were the survey question was it aggregated South Asian groups, but I think it's mm. um, uh, Asian Indians, uh, Pakistani Americans, Sri Lankans, for example. And so, but we can't disaggregate. You know what proportion. Um, are from what South Asian group. So I think there's always this desire to disaggregate further. Um, and mm -hmm. so I see this as sort of preliminary evidence on dementia risk among South Asians who otherwise, to my knowledge, haven't been studied in dementia research. Um, right. And then the, to, to, um, to study them more. And then I think in future studies, we, we probably want to disaggregate to understand, um, understand health in South Asians better as well. Yeah, great, yeah. great question. Yeah, and, and for the foreign born population, did you look at years in the US or did you just do aggregate the foreign born and compare it to the US born? We just had we just had whether people were born in the US or not. I would have loved to have um, yeah. duration of timing in the United States, but it wasn't um, it wasn't asked in the survey. But if I were to you know design a study to follow up on this, we definitely want to think about timing, uh, I think both yeah. duration, how long have people in the US and how old were they when they came to the United States? Because I think both of those could have um, yeah. implications as well. Yeah, absolutely. Especially if you're thinking about this across a life course and trying to pick up those life course measurements too, uh, that might be important. Um, so let's see, uh, there are a few, another question regarding the foreign born versus the US born. Uh, were there any secular trends, um, generational trends, um, such as those who were born, US born were born more recently compared to foreign borns? 
They could be a similar age in the analysis, but because of the time period of available data is so long, secular differences are possible. Yeah, I guess we had two, I think the surveys were kind of done in 2001, 2002, and mostly 2007, 2009. I think we looked at birth year and not just age, but I think I can ask Eleanor to, we can look into it a little bit more. But I think one of the things to consider when we're thinking about heterogeneity across Asian ethnic groups, part of it has to do, like part of what we're looking at are differences in experiences of Filipino Americans versus Japanese Americans. There's also really different push and pull factors and immigration patterns. So mm -hmm. for example, Japanese Americans, the majority, we have a lot of people who are US born and whose families have been in the US for several generations. Um, and the, the comparison of the foreign born versus US born Japanese Americans, it might mean something different than when we're comparing Filipino Americans who are US born versus not when we think about selection forces into immigration. And you might have noticed South Asians weren't included in that sample because there just weren't large enough numbers of US born South Asians in the sample to, to incorporate them into that analysis. But that certainly will, won't be true you know, 20 years from now. Um, yeah. So it's, yeah, I think really relevant when we're, when we're thinking about different Asian American ethnic groups, there's these really different push and pull patterns when we're thinking about mm -hmm. immigration. And then similarly, if you're, you know, is it possible for you to do similar studies on the Hispanic groups within um, Kaiser or is it mostly, I, I know that you're looking at the population in California. So uh, what is the Hispanic um, ethnic breakdown in um, in your population under the Kaiser? Yeah, that's that's a great question. So I think that, so because we're in Kaiser, Northern California, the, the largest um, the largest Latino group represented are, are Mexican-Americans. Um, mm -hmm. But I think it's, it's, yeah, definitely relevant to think about uh, the potential to, to disaggregate in this sample yeah. to, to look further, both within, I think, Candle, the sample's a little bit smaller for disaggregating, but we can peek into it a little bit and then, um, that those surveys in Kaiser where people characterize their, their race and ethnicity in a more granular way than in the EHR, I think there's also the potential to, to disaggregate the um, Hispanic and Latino groups. Okay, great. Um, it looks like there was one more question in the chat box. Um, let's see if I could... Oh, someone is just making a comment. Amazing presentation. Um, similar to how this study was able to have a breakdown of Asian ethnic groups. Has everyone ever looked at a breakdown of Black ethnic groups? For example, Latin, Caribbean, Black, um, American, Black, African, Black groups. Yeah, I think I think that's um, that's a really interesting uh, uh, point. And I think that um, so there's a, a sister study to <laughs> Uh, candle that's led by um, Rachel Whitmer. So Rachel Whitmer mm. is the, the mm -hmm. contact PI on Candle, and she's the, the sole PI on Star, which is a, um, a sister study with harmonized measures in Candle of only people who identify as Black or African American, and that I think could be a potential um, avenue to really try to disaggregate the the Black population as well. Yeah, great point. Yeah, I think that. Yeah. None of these, none of these groups are, are monoliths, and there's always the relevance of disaggregating further. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Well, thank you so much. Uh, we're hidden past the, the two p.m. Um, hour, and we're very happy to see uh, we had a great turnout. Um, lots of great interest, not surprising, <laughs> given our presentation, uh, our presenter. So, thank you all so much for your attention and active participation in today's webinar. Um, again, thank you, Dr. Maida, for that excellent presentation. Uh, could you bring up our next slide, please? Uh, we just want to alert you that our next webinar presentation will be in January, a uh, date to be arranged. And we're very happy um, that Dr. Casey Dieters will be joining us uh, for that presentation. So we'll share more information um, about this webinar, so stay tuned. And we uh, hope that you'll be able to join us again in January. So thank you once again, everyone, and have a wonderful day. Thank you. Bye. Thank you so much. Bye.